Photoshop.com. When you get there, type in Dad's War Photos. It should take you straight to my YouTube channel. Okay. So I have a PowerPoint presentation here. Uh, that, but first of all, I wanted to share with you all that these are some of the books. I've published 13 books. I've written four. The three on the right, on the far right, Slow Cooker Meals, Rice Cooker Meals, and Down Home Cajun Cooking Favorites. I published the remaining books for other people. Uh, the, the books next to that, to the cookbooks, uh, there's, those four books are called the Spiritual Warfare Series. These are true life, true life stories of miraculous answers to prayer and we we're familiar with the term paranormal, but this is paranormal but in the Christian realm of God granting miracles and seeing angels and things of that nature. Uh, next to that is my dad's war photos book and then at that pink book is a collection of stories from our Writers Guild of Acadiana that I compiled. These are short stories that, from different people that we compiled in a book. The one next to that, I have Never Say Goodbye and A House for Eliza. These are written by Constance Moniz. These are, it's classified as historical fiction, although they are based on real true life facts. House for Eliza, once you pick it up and look at the front, you'll see uh, an old couple on there. That's her grandparents' 1893 wedding photo. They owned a huge plantation down in Lafayette, and they had help on the plantation from freed slaves and descendants of freed slaves. The book Never Say Goodbye is a collection of three short stories. One is when the locomotive uh, train first came into Lafayette in the 1880s. And then the uh, second story is the building of St. Mary Magdalene Church in Abbeville. And the third story is when the Union troops came into New Iberia in the Civil War, how the owners of a famous plantation home saved the home and saved their valuables and how they hid them away. I have a little Cajun coloring book there with uh, bilingual English and French uh, page numbers and captions. It's really cute. And then the blue book there is called From Cradle to Grave, The Journey of the Louisiana Orphan Train Riders. That's when back in the early 1900s, around 1907, there were thousands of uh, little children in New York orphanages that the parents either died or were too sick to help them or take care of them, so they were sent to the orphanage. The orphanage made a deal with the Opelousas Catholic Church to please find foster families for these children, and they did. So thousands of little children came down to Opelousas by train, and they were put in foster homes, and that's where they lived, and that's their story. That's why it's called From Cradle to Grave. It lists where they were from, and mostly all New York City and who their parents were, and what happened to them. Did they become successful, um, and so on and so forth. So read the book and you'll find out what happened to those kids. So my name is Neil Bertrand. This is my dad. My dad was in World War II in the South Pacific. He happened to bring along a camera with him This camera here, this is a Kodak camera made around 19, no, it was stopped being manufactured around 1935. So when he took it into the war in 1941, this had been discontinued for, for quite a while. He had a leather carrying case made for it, and on the front of it there's a map of the South Pacific. Did they make that in the Pacific, the, the, the case? He didn't tell me. <clears throat> I don't know where it was made. It looked like you got <laughs> something, a picture or something drawn on it or 
Yeah. Somebody time. drew a map of the South Pacific on it. All right, so this is my dad in 1985 at age 65. Can you see? You want to scoot over one? Oh, no, I'll be all right. You okay? Now, <clears throat> this is where my dad grew up. Let me give you a pointer here. I don't think that's working, Dad. It's not working? No. It was this afternoon. Okay, anyway. There it is. See right here, Mallet? This is Opelousas. Can y'all see? This is Opelousas. This is where I live and, and went to school. West of Opelousas and Mallet, a little farming community. That's where my dad lived, and that's where I lived until I was three years old. He went to LSU for a couple of years. He was in ROTC. And then he went, he uh, was drafted into the Army, and he went from Mallet to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri for boot camp. Right here. From boot camp, he went to Geiger Field, Washington, which is next to Spokane. It's like a, on the side of Spokane, <coughs> Washington. From that's where he did his training for his specialty, and the way this works is you. You go into the army and they say, well, what are you good at? What have you had experience with? Well, I grew up on a farm. I know how to change the oil, grease the, the tractors and, and all that. He says, well, good. We know where to put you. So they put him in an uh, engineer battalion. His job was to change the oil, grease the parts of the bulldozers, graders, packers, rollers, everything having to do with creating airstrips, roads, etc. So he was a, a mechanic. Okay. From Geiger Field, they went by train all the way down to San Francisco. There's a little camp on the outside of San, uh, on the eastern side of San Francisco called Camp Stoneman. They went there and they stayed there a couple of days while they were all the big wigs were getting everything ready to, uh, for the boat ride <coughs> overseas. Then uh, they moved uh, by, uh, by, tr by truck. They carted them all by truck to San Francisco, got on the boat, and they went overseas. What year did they go overseas? That was 1942. Uh, no. 1943, he, he went to boot camp in January 43. He uh, got out and they, they hit the water to go overseas in May, the following May, uh, four months later. All right, so, your young guy, he was 22 years old. <clears throat> And here he is seeing them install 30 caliber machine guns all over the ship to protect the, the ship from uh, enemy planes. As he's going across the ocean, they have a ceremony called King Neptune Ceremony. And this ceremony is centuries old, okay? And the deal is, the first time you cross the equator, you go through this hazing ceremony. What did they do to him? Well, they clipped his hair. Like if you have a head full of hair, you clip chunks out and leave chunks. Okay? So you have the wackiest, weirdest looking hairdo ever. The officers, however, they uh, were hit with wet towels and hit on their back and uh, dumped, dumped in water. I think they were all dumped in a, a, a pool on board the ship. But think, what are the emotions that a 22-year-old would have? Okay, what about fear? Okay, what about 
when they were getting closer to their destination, which was Sydney, Australia, a submarine was spotted. Well, a submarine, one torpedo, could probably sink the ship and everybody die. So fear is an emotion that people like, like my dad could experience. What was the name of the troop ship? How many was on it? Troop ship was, let me see if it's here. No. Um, it's in the book. Okay. Um, so anyway, it, it's in the book. Here, he gets to USS Mount Vernon. USS Mount Vernon. It's on this uh, certificate here. So, they get to uh, Sydney, Australia, and he has time to go to the zoo and sees a kangaroo firsthand. And any idea what this is? It's a steam to run a car on steam. Run it's, on a, steam. it's a coal burning device right. it makes steam. to run your car. Mm -hmm. Put coal in there. Of course, we may not have ever seen coal. I have. But you dump your coal in that canister here and uh, it'll burn it and it produces steam. So this is in uh, Sydney, Australia. How long, were you all on, how long were you on a troop ship? Uh, it was about, I think it took uh, three and a half weeks to get uh, from San Francisco to uh, Australia. So here is a map of Australia. He went to Sydney first, that's down here. They stayed there a couple of weeks and they took a <coughs> train to Brisbane and for you young people, it's not pronounced Brisbane, it's pronounced Brisbane. That's how the Aussies pronounce it. From Brisbane, they took a ship, uh, and that's in the book too, the, uh, uh, I don't remember it right now, but they took a ship to Townsville, and they stayed there uh, about a week, and they got everything organized. Now, you've got to remember, you have all of America, all of these soldiers that are fighting in the South Pacific. I would say the majority of them were going to Australia first, then from there to other places. So you have a lot of organization that needs to take place by the officers and the generals of who goes where and how to supply all these troops. From Townsville, they jump across the Pacific Ocean right here to Oro Bay. That was their first uh, destination in New Guinea. Now here's an overall view of New Guinea. Oro Bay, and the reason they were here was they needed to establish and create some aerodromes. Has anybody does anybody know what an aerodrome is? <coughs> Do you? No? Okay. An aerodrome is an airport. It's an old time way of saying airport. They had a control tower, they had uh, runways, they had taxiways, the whole shebang. All right? So the Dobadora aerodromes, they had several airstrips. Okay, so next. Now, in Dobadura, they have an airstrip here, and this is uh, South Boreo, East MB, North Boreo, and Haranda. These were villages in that area, and they named the airstrips after the villages that they were next to. And you'll also read in the book, Buna, San Ananda Point, and Gona. Uh, there was some activity that happened in these places here, uh, Japanese attacks. <clears throat> okay, so, building an airdrome. Here is a dump truck filled with rocks and gravel, and look how they're emptying the load with a crane. You're lifting up the front end and, and everything falls out the back. Anybody ever heard of Ragley, Louisiana? Oh, yeah. 
This is Bill Habits. Yeah, do you know any Habits folks from Ragley? He was a rice farmer. And on the farm, he learned how to operate a bulldozer because they needed that for the farm work. So what does he do? He gets into the army and he operates a bulldozer. And my dad was uh, the best man at Mr. Ragley's wedding. I was about to say funeral. Sorry. Um, all right. What goes up must come down. Anybody have an idea what this is? Search lights and looks like looking for airplanes. This is anti-aircraft fire that had what appears to be three anti-aircraft positions. And you can tell from the angle of the, uh, the, the tracer fire going up. So when the Japanese were coming flying in, there was a red alert sounded and the aircraft anti-aircraft guns started firing. On a night like this, my dad and his bunkmate, there was two men per tent, each had their own cot with the space in the middle, a little walkway. They were sound asleep and then all of a sudden a chunk of metal falls through their tent and lands in the dirt right between the two cots. Mm. I think one of those anti-aircraft guns knocked a chunk of wing or motor or something off of that and it fell down and it could have killed my dad or his, his friend very easily. From Oro Bay, they stayed there from August 43 until January 5th. And so January 5th, they load up and they get on a LST, which means landing ship tank, LST. And they get on this landing ship tank and they go from here around this point to Sador, New Guinea. And one of the reasons was that there was a lot of Japanese troops trying to escape being captured and they were going through this mountain range right here and uh, so they wanted to head them off at the pass like to say in the old westerns and so MacArthur <coughs> issued orders that they move to Sador and so while they were at Sador they also built more airdromes for the planes to refuel and go and bomb the enemy now, in Sador, you're near a mountain range, and there are rivers like this, there are deep gorges that need to have bridges built over, and so that's what an engineering battalion would do. They would build bridges and repair roads and so on and so forth. This is called an H-10 Bailey Bridge, the 10 means that this bridge can hold 10 tons of weight. And so you can see the troops, they're in the process of finishing up this bridge. You can see a truck here, another truck here. And this is called an abutment. You have to make this to, uh, to shore up the sides of the, of the dirt wall to have a place for the bridge to set on, and there's a reason I'm telling you this. Okay, I'll tell you in a second. Where did these timbers come from? Do you just call the lumber yard and say, hey, I need a whole bunch of timbers? Well, in effect, that's what they did because they have their own lumber yard. They have their own sawmill. This is their sawmill. This is the saw right here. That's the blade. They, the operation, the, the lumber came from the trees in the forest. You send out a team of lumberjacks, the New Guinea lumberjacks, and they cut the trees with axes. And here my dad is posing with uh, these two little lumberjacks. And my dad was about 
five eleven, six foot. Look how sharp these guys are. So, what is he holding here? Does anybody know? Thompson like submachine gun. Thompson submachine gun. A Thompson submachine gun. Very good. They held fifty rounds. They, the lumberjacks needed protection from the Japanese in the area, so they always had to have uh, somebody stand guard to uh, protect them. Okay, now, let me get back to the lumber yard. Um, so they would go into the forest, they'd cut down the trees, they would haul the trees to the lumber yard, roll the trees down the ramp, and push them into the, uh, into the saw pit, uh, where they would cut the lumber into whatever they needed, whether it was beams for a bridge or what have you. Well, they put that type of material down on an airfield that was all dirt, didn't they? That material? <clears throat> they had to the prepare, SD, yeah. they had to prepare the field, the dirt, um, with, depending on the, the, the structure of the, the, the composition of the dirt, uh, they had gravel fields nearby, and uh, there's a picture in the book of Dad showing an, an explosion in the gravel pit, uh, creating you know loose gravel for them to haul. So they had to prepare the field with gravel or big stones or sand or what have you, smooth it and pack it. And this here is called uh, Marston matting or perforated steel planking. You can see the holes in that. These strips were 10 foot long and they would interlink one with the other. Here's a finished strip. Can y'all see that? This is packing a... Okay, he's packing a revetment. A revetment is a parking spot for a plane. He's in an engineer aviation battalion. They are all about planes, having the planes on hand to go out on missions, either B-24s or fighters or, or different types of bombers. In the back of the book, there is an appendix with 14 different categories of airplanes. And so here is Lieutenant Betson on a tractor pulling a packer, a rolling packer, and he is packing the revetment. Now, this, a revet of, what do you do when you have 100 airplanes and you have to park them somewhere? So you have to build parking lots for the planes. The parking lot, you can't just put them all on the runway, all in, an, in a line, because the Japanese could come and in one pass strafe and bomb a whole strip of 100 planes. So they didn't do that. They built their parking lot in a curved way so there was no straight lines. And so if you can imagine an S-curve, and along that S-curve there are parking spots off-centered. Off well, okay, so you have a parking spot. You have to haul gravel and rock and all that to make it firm because you don't want a 100,000-pound B-24 bomber to be sinking in the mud. So it has to be a very firm foundation. Here, they're building a levee around that parking spot. Everybody knows what a levee is, right, in South Louisiana? You know what that is? Well, that's like 15 foot high so that if a bomb drops, if the enemy drops a bomb in this parking spot and the bomb fragments scatter, you need something to stop those fragments from destroying a plane next door. All right? So here you see the graders and packers and uh, scraper pans. Uh, this is called a scraper pan, a dirt scraper. That thing, uh, that adjustment here can go up and down. 
if he wants to uh, grab some dirt, he will pull it down and a uh, good way to move dirt. This is, this is the dispersal area or airplane parking lot at Mockmer Airdrome in Biak, which we'll talk, to, talk about in a minute. This looks like a zipper, right? Well, each one of these black dots, that's a revetment or a parking spot for a plane. This is the beach road and this right here is the ocean. So I'll show you that in a few minutes. So, time to move. They move from Sador to Biak Island just off the coast of New Guinea. Now, the Biak, the, the Biak Island was taken over on the day after D-Day. It was very, the Japanese had it very well planned. They knew exactly where they were going to go and what they were going to attack. And so they attacked Biak <laughs> Island. They uh, started building fortifications, setting up cannons and everything. And two years later, when it was time to invade Biak, the Japanese were ready for them. Here is the, the destination where they were going, Mockmer Airdrome on the southern tip of the island. <coughs> the Japanese had built three airdromes here, Mockmer, Boroko, and Cerrito. Well, Daddy was stationed at Mockmer. Other engineering battalions went to these others. Here, you see this? line here, this is a plateau. This is a ridge. It's kind of hard to show it on this uh, drawing, but it went from sea level <coughs> up to 200 feet. Wow. Now, if you can picture a 20-story building, that's 200 feet. And here, on top of this plateau, the Japanese had installed pillboxes. Now, when I think of a pillbox, I think of Saving Private Ryan. You, oh, anybody saw that show? Yeah. Okay. Elizabeth, you saw it? Okay. When they crashed on the beach, when they landed on the beach, who was shooting? The Germans were shooting at them from this huge concrete pillbox with cannons pointing out of it. Well, here, they didn't have a concrete plant, so they made pillboxes out of coconut trees coconut logs. So, to make matters worse, you had in this 200 foot rise of plateau, all through that area that was caves where the Japanese were hiding in with their guns, bazookas, and, and other equipment. What group uh, island was that? Huh? What group island is that? That's uh, Biak Island off the coast of uh, um, south of the Guinea. Philippines? Huh? South of the Philippines? Yeah, way south. Way south. All right. This is some equipment that Dad took pictures of. This is a Duck W353. This uh, has six wheels made by GMC. This is called a Buffalo. These are tracked vehicles, like a tank has tracks. This has tracks. And these are personnel, I guess you call that personnel carriers. Here are some pictures of just destroyed Japanese tanks. We've got three of them. It's hard to see all three, but here, here is one. Here is another one with the top part absolutely blown off like this. That's gone. And these are logs that uh, had gotten knocked down during the fighting. This is a Japanese pillbox made out of coconut logs. And you see they had, they had a camp there and they were cooking and whatever. And so they'd get inside here and shoot their rifle at the, uh, at the oncoming troops. Here's a Japanese cannon uh, that was on top of that Plateau. This one here got uh, put out of business.
it took from the reason we don't, I think, the reason we don't hear much of BIAC is because BIAC was invaded by the U.S. and Allied forces on the same day as the Normandy D-Day invasion, June 6, 1944. All the attention went to Europe. So they landed on Biak June 6, and they start, the infantry comes in, and they start fighting. They had a very hard battle to defeat the Japanese there. It took about six weeks. And finally, they, they kicked the Japanese out of Biak, and this is what they left behind. They left some bombs behind and some other things. Here, the U.S. troops who had artistic ability would draw or paint things on the side of whatever they could find. This says, Tojo's miscarriage, so sorry, please. Making fun of the Japanese and how they talk with their, their accent. This is an Australian soldier taking a break, sitting on the bumper or the running board of a Japanese truck that has some holes in it, produced by American troops, I'm sure. Here's a guy signing autographs. Yeah, you young guys, you all have any idea who this guy in the helmet is right here? Has anybody ever heard of Bob Hope? <laughs> Bob Hope was at Machmer Airdrome. He and his crew of entertainers were there putting on what's called a USO show. Have you all ever heard of that? A USO? They, they go on tour. And I think they still do that even today. Well, here's Bob Hope signing autographs, and Dad took that picture. I said, Dad, did you get him to sign your auto his autograph? Nah. <laughs> this is his plane. No, he got his photograph. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the photograph lasted a whole lot longer than some of those autographs, That's I bet. Right. He flew in a C-54 Skymaster. So that's, uh, that's one of the pictures. Okay, so they're on Biak Island. Now it's time to leave and they're going to their next destination. This is an LST, landing ship tank. And so these gates, see these gates, kind of hard to see, but they, when they close, they're airtight, and then they open up like this to let the vehicles come in or just to go out. Here they're loading up, it's time to go. So they, they're loading up their equipment, and the way this works, after some research, I find out, found out how this works. When they drive their equipment into the, the ship, if they, the equipment stops on an elevator. Then the elevator rises to the top deck and they drive off. And they do that for the whole time. And you asked me a question, how many people were on the ship uh, leaving to go to Australia. I can tell you that there were 800 men in his battalion. And a battalion is a big team of people, big team of workers. They were divided into four companies, A, B, C, and H and S, which stands for Headquarters and Service. Dad was in H and S, which meant he was like a, a free agent, or a, a, wherever they needed him, that's where he went. He was that whole company of 200 men that they needed people to do carpenter work or guard or whatever. That's what they did. All right, now it's time to leave BIAC, and they have to go to... Eastern Samar. 
Okay, BIAC is like way down here, and so they have to take a, an LST, I think they want an LST, and they go to Eastern Seymour. See this little peninsula here? They went there to do a favor for the U.S. Navy. They, the Navy wanted a beach road that was like several miles long here. And they needed the help of the bulldozers and graders and all the machinery that my dad's company had. And one of the things I found out that was interesting <laughs> was that there was some, in this area of beach that they needed developed into a road, there was coral there, coral obstructions, hard as concrete. They had to blow them up. So imagine a little country boy from St. Andrew Parish getting to watch things being blowed up. Yee-hoo! So, from, let's see what's next. Okay, so this gives you an idea of the trip from Biak to Calicoan Island in the Philippines. So they helped the Navy build the beach road and this town here called Giwan. And so this is Calicoan Island where they built the beach road there. All right, so they, get, they do the job, they get ready to leave. And so they have to go to northern Luzon. And so they take this shortcut through this channel here. And they are on their way to the battle of the Lingayen Gulf. A battle is in progress in northern Luzon, Philippines. This would be north of Manila, and I'll show you a map in a minute. So, <clears throat> you're on a ship, you're traveling to war, real war. As they get closer, you see out in the distance the USS Philadelphia, no, USS Pennsylvania, it's a huge battleship, and it's shooting its big old huge cannons at tanks on shore, on land, because the tanks were shooting at the ships. Not to mention uh, pilots flying their planes into the ships. They were called kamikaze pilots. And so Daddy was an eyewitness to all of this, action going on. And that day, they lost, the U.S. lost a lot of ships because of the kamikaze pilots uh, flying their planes into, uh, you know, suicide bombers, what we know of today. So they land in this landing zone. It was 20 miles wide. This area here of the Lingayen Gulf is right there. It was 20 miles wide and there was a lot of activity. They were coming in to help the Filipino people. This is one of the guns that Daddy took a picture of, 240 millimeter Howitzer M1. The shell on that fit into that cannon weighed 360 pounds, and it could fire the projectile 14 miles. That's how powerful that thing is. This cannon was used in the Battle of Manila. The Japanese were inside what's called the walled city. They had dug in there and they weren't leaving. They had to be killed or kicked out. Uh, and that inside of that walled city was where Dad found this Japanese war rifle and bayonet. In the process of rebuilding what the Japanese destroyed, they had to have a supply dump. And here is tons and tons and tons of material, wire, and so on and so forth. Oh, the, when the Japanese heard that the Americans had landed and the Americans were approaching Manila, they destroyed all of the railroad bridges, all of the highway bridges, 
destroyed the runway at the nearby airport at Clark Field. And so my dad's battalion, as well as other battalions, that was their job to rebuild the infrastructure in the Philippines. So imagine using, needing supplies to help do that. <coughs> in the appendix, I have two appendix in the back of the book. One is on the 14 types of World War II airplanes and one is on New Guinea natives. This is my dad's friend, Jack Vautier from Opelousas. He was a, a youngster. He was about the same age as that. He was a pilot. This was his plane. The plane was named Hong Lo. And the emblem on the side of the plane is uh, a bat wing. So, and a uh, bat wing, and then the shark's, to, shark's mouth uh, emblem on that B-25. Dad was friends with Jack because Jack's daddy was a grocery salesman for a church point wholesale. My dad's father owned a grocery store, so that's how they got to know each other. And so, like I said, Appendix 2 has scenes from New Guinea, natives. This, uh, on the back of the, this photo, Daddy wrote, Fuzzy Wuzzy. <laughs> and I was wondering, okay, he's making fun of his hair or what. But in doing research, which I, I worked on this book for three years, I found out that there was a group of people like this man, they were called Fuzzy Wuzzy Angels. And the reason why is these were stretcher bearers. Whenever there was a, a soldier that got injured out in the woods, in the, in the forest, uh, and there were enemy all around shooting, they risked their lives to one, you know, two, two men, one on each end of the stretcher, to bring the uh, troops to the nearest uh, medical uh, facility. So I have a, a lot of respect for these guys. Here's a, an, a, a New Guinea, I don't know if you call him a warrior, but he's wearing a headdress. And uh, three little kids. My dad made a grass skirt for one of the little boys who was totally naked. He made that out of string and tape. Because the little boys and little girls, they didn't wear anything. They didn't wear any clothes. It wasn't until they got older that, that they wore something. Okay, well, the rest is uh, <laughs> jokes and stuff, but uh, anyway, uh, that's it for the today's presentation. Do you have any questions? No? Well, you can feel free to shop around at my books, uh, look at the souvenirs. I have paintings. Could I make a comment about sure. the, the Bailey Bridge? Yes. That was developed by the British. Right. And it was a very versatile bridge, and it could be erected without any heavy equipment, just men. Erected and launched. They put a nose a lightweight nose made out of building various parts at the, at the front of it so that it would, when it, um, when it crossed the, um, the stream, the river, it would tilt down. And uh, they would push it. They'd, yeah. they'd get, uh, you know, a, a, a company of men, maybe a hundred of them, behind that thing. It was on rollers, like right. a railroad track. And they would push it across this river. And they could built all kinds of different configurations of this thing. And there was a company, I think in Michigan, and they may still build that thing. A few years ago, you could order a Bailey Bridge. Really? And in, in, uh, in the late 50s, there was one that was in use about 40 miles or so southeast of Baton Rouge across the bayou down there. Okay. 
near a French settlement or French something or other. Yeah, that's a town called French, French settlement. settlement. Okay. And it, I, I saw that before I ever saw one in the army. Right. All right, folks. Any other questions? If not, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.